Hi everyone, welcome to the CSAE Research Podcast Series. It's a series of conversations about projects taking place in collaboration with the Center for the Study of African Economies at the University of Oxford. I'm Noam Angrist, a fellow at the CSAE, and also the co-founder of Young Love, an NGO committed to scaling up evidence-based interventions in health and education that enable youth to thrive. Today, we're going to hear about the work of Young Love in collaboration with CSAE and j and some of the work that this collaboration led to in generating some of the first experimental evidence on distance education during the COVID pandemic in Botswana. We're going to go today under the hood of this RCT and talk about some of the juicy detail that doesn't always make it into the academic paper. So today I'm very excited to welcome three additional guests, Tato Letsomo, Moitepi Macheng, and Claire Cullen. And I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves very briefly. Uh, Tato. Thank you so much, Noam. My name is Tato Letsomo. I am the Senior Manager for Content and Training, and I'm one of the pioneers of Law Tech uh, program. And I have led the content development. I have led the pilot process, the training, and together with the implementation. I'm super excited to be here and to chat with everyone. Thank you so much. Moitepi. Thanks so much, Noam. Hi, I'm Moitepi Macheng, co-founder and country coordinator for um, Young Love. And in my other role, I'm also the chairperson of Botswana's National Youth Council. Wonderful. And Claire? Thanks, Noam. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Young Love and also at CSAE at Oxford University. And I've been working on the replication studies with Young Love. Brilliant. Well, what a wonderful group. It's so great to be here all together. Uh, Moitepi, can you share a little bit more about Young Love? I would be more than happy to. So background on Young Love. Firstly, we're celebrating a huge milestone. We have reached over 100,000 young people. Our headquarters are in Botswana, but also we have made partnerships across eight countries now. We are working on three evidence-based programs in health and education. We have signed memorandums of understanding with the government to reach all schools in the country. Really excited about the work that we're doing as an organization. Thanks so much, Martepi. So happy to be here with all of us together on this podcast, because we really are going to be digging into this intersection of research uh, and action and and policy. So uh, really excited to dig in. Uh, A bit of context on this study before we get into the juicy detail. Uh, So this was some of the world's first experimental evidence during the pandemic on distance education. As many will know, the COVID crisis was a historic shock to education. And at the height of the pandemic, over a billion children were out of school. And so a question arose uh, for many education systems, how do you provide education when schools close? So one of the things that struck me about this work Uh, is that many governments responded with higher tech approaches, things like trying things uh, that focused on online, computer, tablets, uh, but often access to these types of distance learning were low in low and middle income countries. In contrast, lower tech approaches like using mobile phones were high access and low cost. Over 80% of households in low and middle income countries have access to mobile phones. So one of the neat things about this study and this innovation is it used mobile phones to meet people where they were with a technology they were already familiar with and provided both SMS messages and live 20 minute phone calls once a week to do targeted foundational numeracy content. The results were really striking of this study with a reduction in the numeracy of 31%, also quite cost effective, one year of high quality learning per $100 per child. Now this approach since the study came out in Botswana in the early part of the pandemic has since gone global and there's now five country studies, five randomized trials with 25,000 students all over the world replicating and extending this work. So we're gonna come back to this. Uh, I wanna come back to the Botswana study before we zoom back out to the global effort. So let's go under the hood. Young Lab was implementing in-school education programs when the pandemic struck in Botswana in 20% of schools. Tato, can you share a little bit about this pivot? Uh, how did it happen? Put us there. Put us in the moment. Uh, You were obviously leading the charge here. 
Thank you so much, Noam. Um, I think like you have said, when uh, the pandemic happened, we were in schools doing our, uh, doing our normal business, which is teaching at the right level, implementing teaching at, at the right level in four regions in different schools. And our field workers were uh, busy with that. Then it was announced by the Minister of Education that schools will be closing in two days until further notice. So you can wonder when they say further notice, like further notice is further notice. You wouldn't know when will the schools reopen. So for us, we wanted to still, to still be committed to the cause by connecting to our young people, by connecting to the children and making sure that we are still doing something with them. I remember I had to get in a call with Noam and say, we have just heard that the schools are closing in two days and they would uh, it's until further notice but we want to stay connected with the kids what can we do uh to help uh the kids while they are home so we were brainstorming and figuring out what we can do in just two days so we agreed that let's collect phone numbers then we will later see what we are going to do with those phone numbers so we agreed on the that our field workers, like I have said, were already in the field. So we called the field workers to say, please, in the next two days, be collecting phone numbers uh, for the parents or for the guardians of our kids who are in grade three until grade five. And fortunate enough for some of the schools, they already have the contacts with them and some didn't have the contacts. So we have to ask the, the teachers to ask the students to go and talk to their parents to give us their phone numbers then we'll get in touch with them. And we didn't even make any promises of when we'd get in touch and what exactly would, be, would we be doing because we didn't figure all that out. But fortunate enough, in just two days, we managed to collect 10,000 numbers from all the schools that we are working are in in all those four regions. And it was just that. And we ended there with just collection of the contacts. Then we later figured out what we are going to do with those numbers. Wow. I remember being in those conversations together, Tato, and I still think you have four arms and legs, uh, just uh, such a feat. So yeah. you mentioned, Tato, that you were involved in delivering uh, in-school programming before this pivot, and in particular, a program called Teaching at the Right Level, uh, which many of our listeners might know, is another very cost-effective evidence-based education program focused on really targeting children's learning levels rather than necessarily their age or grade uh, through simple assessments and then targeting instruction. Can you talk us through how you thought about adapting some of the things that were done in teaching at the right level uh, now to these phone-based uh, phone calls and, and content delivery? Thank you so much, Noam. This was a very exciting process. And I think, like I have said, you can imagine all this happened during lockdown and uh, when the pandemic was just starting. And I think which was kind of like a shock to everyone. And like I have said, for us, it was more into how we, do we stay committed to our costs and adapt whatever we have to make sure that we are still connected to our kids. Then the first thing that we agreed on was to see how best can we adapt uh, teaching at the right level into a phone-based uh, program. The, I remember vividly, I was in most of the pilot stage, I was in my room. I took my phone, I took my brother's phone to record as I'm making the calls. And you can, someone can ask, who are you calling in the pilot stage? We are calling some of our friends who have kids in the ages of 11 to 12, 11, 12 and 13. And we are calling some of our colleagues who have all these kids or probably even friends to our colleagues. So it, it was just kind of like a sample from the people that we know, but that have the kids who fall within our target group. So I was making those calls and borrowing my brother's phone and recording in the process as I'm doing this because we are figuring out what exactly would we want to do and um so it sounds like you're going low tech about low tech you know no recording studio nothing fancy you're just making these calls from home just like the kids are going to receive them 
definitely it was all that then as we are piloting because what is in my mind was just more into teaching at the right level and i think probably most of you might know what teaching at the right level uh, is and what we do with the kids it's fun engaging we do a lot of games and all that and i wanted to try that over the phone I remember in the very first pilots, I would even call some kids. I would I'd try to explain how to do certain games like stone throw. And I would be giving all these instructions that are too much when the kids are not seeing. And remember, this is happening over the phone and it's a phone call. And I will be giving them all the instructions of how to do the stone throw, get nine stones, draw this cycle, bigger cycle, and draw the other cycle inside. The kids were so confused and I could feel it. In the, I could feel their voice that the kids are so confused. They're wondering who is the stranger who is calling me and giving me a lot of confusing instructions. So because this was happening during the pilot stage, we had to try different things. And I remember within probably a lot of teaching at the right level activities, we have a lot of call to responses. And that is Eta, Ola, how are you feeling better? I tried that. I was like, oh, okay, Eta, the child was saying hola and i told the child when i say hola you say eta i, I immediately i heard that the child's face was bright and i heard even the voice that it literally changed from when i was doing the stone throw so it was super exciting uh to hear all this and to see that oh okay so we have adopted some of the things and the main thing was to keep it very simple as much as we can and we landed there to say Keep it simple. I love that. And how amazing that just an Eta and an Ola can bring something to life and, and is so simple. Um, and that you adapted from uh, kind of getting the content across, but also making it doable over the phone and still fun. Uh, that's great. Anything else that, that's, that struck you as you did this adaptation? Yeah, and more so that you have said that maybe let's 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 give it a little bit of a try so that people oh, okay. get a sense of what exactly we were doing over the phone uh, that excited the kids. When I say Eta, Noem, you should respond by saying Ola. When I say Ola, you say Eta. Are we together? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Eta. Ola. Ola. Eta. Nice one. I can even see your smile from just here. I can sense it from just this it's call here, that you are here. super excited. Evidence-based. <laughs> it works. Not Definitely. So those are kind of like some of the things that we're doing. And the other thing that we focused on was the foundational skills. And uh, we're saying, oh, okay, we can't do much, but what are some of the things that we feel we can do with the kids so that when they get back to schools after the schools reopen and we don't know when will that be, at least they have not lost much. So we wanted to focus in just kind of like those foundational skills and making it very simple as much as, as we can. We are targeting those kids into helping them in simple addition, simple subtraction, simple multiplication, and simple division. And when I say simple, I mean like just two digits by two digits, uh, two digits by one digit when we are doing multiplication and also division. So those are some of the things that we are really uh, focusing on when we were uh, looking into the foundational skills and making sure that we are keeping it as simple as we can, doing addition of 22 plus 12, for example, 27 minus 13, 22 times 3, 33 divided by 2. Those are some of the things that we're doing with the kids and taking them through the process. And it was super exciting to see how it has been translated over the phone. Got it. Okay, so this, this focus on foundational skills, still constant and still there, even as you made this pivot. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like, and perhaps the jury is still out on some of the higher competencies, but at least on these foundational skills, it seems like that was translating. Um, anything else? There is more definitely that we can talk about. And I. there is also one of the things that we are looking into as we are adapting this. Uh, we are looking into targeted instruction, and I'm sure most of you probably are aware of what teaching at the right level is. And for just in the phone-based uh, uh, program, we are not only looking into waiting for the baseline results, waiting for the midline results, because what happens, like I have said, we are targeting the foundational skills, is to make sure that 
that when the child um, understands subtraction, you start them from there. You can't give the child division before you check, before you know that they know multiplication. So this is what we are also looking into. And this is what, what our focus was. We're making sure that we are starting the child where they are. We are making our instructions very targeted. If we assessed you from baseline and we are realizing that you only ended, you are only able uh, to do addition, then we know that we are going to help you from subtraction until you know subtraction and you master it. That's when you can move to multiplication. And like I have said, we are not only relying into the baseline and end line results that are kind of like happening after weeks. Every time after the call, in the call, there is what is called checkpoint. So checkpoint is, is a problem of that day or problem of that week. So it happens at the end of the call. For example, in a particular call, when I'm calling my child, which is Kidumete for that particular week or for that particular day, I would be making, I, I know that, okay, this week I, I am targeting Kidumete and giving her instructions on addition, two digits by two digits. So I will do my problem of two digits by two digits with, with Kidumete and taking her through the process of doing 22 plus 13. And after we walk through it together, at the end of the call, before I hang up on that call, I would give her what is called checkpoint. I would ask it to me, say, please, can you please do 27 plus 12 for me? And as you are doing 27 plus 12, please say it loud and let me hear what you are doing and give me the answer. So I'm not helping her through the checkpoint because it's more like a problem of the day. I want to see where they are. And the other thing, remember, this is happening one on one base. So those are some of the things that we're doing when you're thinking about targeted uh, instructions, focusing where the child is at and also helping them through the checkpoint and not waiting only on the baseline or also on the midline that comes after weeks. Every week, you have to understand where the child is at. And for more so that you are calling most of the time, the same people that you have been calling, you have a deeper understanding of where my child is at. Next time when I call her, where do I start here? Got it. So still being able to target instruction and maybe in some ways this one-on-one -on -one interaction even more targeted. So as we know in, in class, you can do small groups, you can assess, and it, it can be quite targeted if you get it right. It sounds like um, over the phone one-on-one, -on -one, uh, there's really scope to, to target it even further. So that's really interesting. And, and you know, I, I know that that's something that we didn't actually even expect at the beginning and, and we found to be to be the case. Uh, yeah. Any other principles, uh, Tata, that you wanted to highlight? I probably wouldn't have done justice to this discussion if I don't mention the issue of ratio, of which I think it was kind of like one of the biggest lesson and exciting one. When we approached this adaptation from TAR to the phone-based program, we are thinking of at class in our teaching. And remember, like I have said, we're just coming from the class and we're in field when the pandemic happened. And our ratio of a teacher to students was one is to 30 or even even more. So when we came to the phone based, we were thinking around the same thing of around one is to 30. Believe me, this is one of the biggest lessons that we had to learn in this process and realize that over the phone, it's not going to be possible that we are targeting uh, one facilitator or one teacher, it's given 30 students or even more. But we started like that uh, when we started the pilot. So what ha what happens for you to probably to arrive for us? Uh, what happened for us to for us to arrive to the fact that one is to thirty doesn't work and the phone based. Every time you are making the call, allow me to use an example of the child kidumets, and as I have explained, uh, as I was doing more like an example of the targeted instruction. When I call kidumets, remember I'm calling her from the parents on the guardian's phone. And before I reach to Kidumete, I have to make, I have to reach the mother. 
At times, the mother is not with the child at that particular time. At times, the mother is not picking up the phone. At times, the phone is unavailable. At times, they are saying, I'm not with the child. Please call back at 6 o'clock. When I call at 6, they're saying, I'm still not with the child. Please call at 7. When I call at 7, they said, okay, the child just left. I've sent her to the shop. Please call back at 30 minutes. In 30 minutes. So you can think of all that time before you reach the child, it's not just the 20 minutes to 30 minutes call that you are making. There is a lot of time that goes into just reaching out or talking to that child because the focus or the target is to, at the end of the day, for you to say it was a success, is to talk to the child, but not just reaching out to the parent or to the guardian. So you realize that in each and every child, probably it takes around two hours for you to end up targeting or to, for you to end up talking to the child. So we realize that, oh, okay, we will resolve to not saying one is to 30, but saying one at least is to 20. And when you are giving one facilitator 20 household to call or 20 children to be calling, that means it's almost 40 hours of their time. And that is almost like just full-time up employment and this is one of the things that is kind of like very very important and when you go beyond the 20 you are not going to find the eight hours that you can focus in a day you are not going to find enough time that you are going to say i would be calling chances are that you would miss some of the kids for that particular week because there was a lot of time that was invested in calling looking for the kids so believe me one is to 20 really works and that is almost like 40 hours because one child for you to reach one child most of the time it's it takes two hours of your time on it. And so that's, that's really interesting because it's not just the program, it's also the delivery model, uh, getting the ratio right. And, and half the battle is just reaching the household. Yeah. Um, so that, that's really striking. Um, well, thank you so much for, for highlighting some of these core principles and active ingredients to make this work. Uh, it's clear it's much more than the call. It's a good pedagogy and a good call, the right platform and the right pedagogy. Shifting gears a bit, Moitepi, from your hat, uh, both as a, a leader of Young Lab and also through your role as the chairperson of the government's youth council and kind of the overall government view, uh, can you walk us through a bit some of the policy implications? What were some of the other popular government responses? How does this relate to those? Thank you so much, Noam. So during the pandemic, uh, the government through the Ministry of Basic Education rolled out a TV and radio program to ensure students are learning uh, whilst out of school and during the lockdown period. Uh, whilst this was done, uh, particularly also at national levels, there were challenges in the actual rollout. For example, we've heard from the young people that we work with that the time in which the programs were played, uh, students were usually not available. Uh, we also heard that the content was not relatable uh, because it needed that youthful element and therefore the students didn't engage much with it. That means that essentially there was a low take up rate. We found that only 20% of students were able to tune into the TV and radio programs. Relatively speaking, we have found with the phone-based learning, we have found a higher take-up rate of over 70% from the numbers and the contacts that we reached out to, mainly who are parents as well as students. So we found that because this phone-based learning allowed for this one-on-one -on -one connection, ensured that students are engaged, but also there's a higher take-up rate as compared to some of the government programs that they rolled out. Really interesting. And what do you see being the big implications of this work for government and for policy? And I know we've had a lot of conversations directly with the Ministry of Education on, on what this can look like as part of the core government response. I think this is a very important question. Firstly, let me say that this is not the first time disruptions happen. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that the schools may shut down in some instances. In the future, 
there could be, you know, natural disasters where, where schools may close for a long while. And therefore, it is important as we reflect with the government ways to develop a toolkit that will be based on phone based learning and how to support students where in school classroom is impossible in case of any emergencies or anything that may come out. Uh, we need to see how to provide a toolkit as a base uh, to ensure that learning doesn't stop and learning continues. I must also add another point is that this intervention has been one of the most effective programs, cost effective programs in the literature. This has provided 0.89 standard deviation learning gains per $100 USD. And then we find that often at times the government has and spends large budgets on ICT. We think that this could be repurposed to focus on pedagogy rather than hardware, which the government usually provides. I would just like to share a story that I heard from a parent. Ginelo's mom usually rushes home after work because she knows that she's soon to receive a call from a young love facilitator. This approach has really brought parents and students together. It has really shown that parents and students can be involved in their child's learning. The status quo is that the parent only meets the teacher or the school heads after at the end of every term when they go and collect the report card. But we find that uh, this approach can certainly provide long-term implications for the role of technology and parents in a child's education, rather than using or rather than engaging parents only on information such as collecting the report cards. Parents and students are really able to learn together, but also be involved in ensuring that they can be able to know what is happening in their child's education. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a, a approach for education in emergencies that helps ensure resilience, uh, using technology to meet people where they are, not just throwing hardware, but really focusing on the pedagogy and direct parent engagement. Um, some really striking examples of, of important policy implications. Uh, thank you so much for that. We've heard a lot about some successes with this approach, but as we know, um, there's always a lot of failures. Uh, so I would love to hear a bit on what did not work, what has been a failure, and to, to really dig into the good, the bad, and the ugly. So Tato, can you share a, a failure? Yeah, I would say probably one of the biggest challenge for us was scheduling. Scheduling, scheduling, scheduling was a challenge. And I think probably as someone was listening to when I was talking about the ratio was already imagining how could have this been a challenge because I think you don't just kind of like pick a phone call then you reach the child immediately so I think that's kind of like was the biggest uh, challenge on our side and believe me there were times where facilitators kind of like the people who are calling were so much um the feeling demotivated and they needed a lot of motivation. I remember there were a lot of times I have to get in a call and we had a WhatsApp group. I had to post and remind them or try to say, I totally understand. Let's figure things out together. What do you think would best work? And also remind them of our cause. We have this uh, slogan that we always say, Mwana Kupi. And immediately we say that they know that and wanakopili means a child first. When anyone says this, they know that, oh, okay, it means we need to motivate ourselves. So we don't just say it anyhow. Probably this is kind of like one of the things that we say when we are faced with challenges or obstacles. So when I said that, it reminded them that we have to think about this child and no matter how much probably we are trying to call the guardian or the parent many, many times and not reaching them, that we should be thinking of if I don't get hold of the shot, they might be losing of something that would probably benefit them. So I would say that was kind of like one of the biggest things. So, and they needed a lot of motivation. They needed a lot of kind of like hyping them up and also an understanding of, I understand what you are talking about because I have done the pilot. I have made the calls as well. And for me, think of, I was calling 
people that I know. I was calling some of my friends' kids. I was calling some of the relatives. Even when they are finding the number of the, of someone that they know, it takes them time to respond. At times, they don't pick up the phone. At times, the phone is unavailable. But now think of when a stranger number from Young Love is calling you and you don't know them. It feels like, oh, okay, I, I don't feel the pressure to pick up this call. So scheduling, scheduling, scheduling was a challenge for us. Scheduling, scheduling, scheduling. I won't forget that. <laughs> Thank you, Tato. Uh, Claire, anything on your end that, that you wanted to highlight? Something that didn't work so well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of optimism, maybe from governments, researchers, young love and others that SMSs would prove to be a cheap and scalable option to improve learning given school closures. However, unfortunately, I think our research is, it's seeming to suggest that SMSs on their own just don't seem to be improving learning. Got it, and, and that would be so cheap and scalable, but it, it does not seem to be, at least in our study, ha have borne fruit. So thank you for highlighting that. And I know we actually did a follow-up A-B test in Botswana after this study to see if we doubled the dosage to SMSs per week, could that, could that make a difference? Uh, and it also didn't. So it does seem uh, the phone call coupled with the SMS is quite key. So that's an important lesson on what can work as well as what can't work. Shifting gears and in a similar spirit, this approach is not going to be a silver bullet. And it does seem clear from this conversation, and I know from our work, that there are some core active ingredients to really get this right. And it's important that we, we get it right, because as, as was highlighted, this can be, if done well, uh, part of the package of approaches for education and emergencies, uh, which are going to continue happening, as well as thinking about broader themes of technology, parental engagement, and learning when school is out. Claire, could you share a little bit about some of the, the replication trial where we've been actively working in five countries with various partners all over the world, now reaching 25,000 students to test when this does translate across contexts, when it doesn't, how scalable it is. Uh, so we'd love to hear a bit more about that to foreshadow uh, what the Botswana study has, has inspired. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, We've finished or almost finished randomized trials in now five countries. So Kenya, Nepal, India, the Philippines, and Uganda. And this is all in less than 12 months, which is kind of wild. Um, and we've worked really hard with partners in these countries to generate this evidence so quickly. And we think that this might actually be some of the fastest multi-country rigorous evidence generated in education, which is very exciting. Again, we've got four arms and four legs. Um, very, very striking. And, and who says rigorous evidence can't happen quickly? I think we're seeing that it can and can be used to inform real-time responses as well as, as the literature. And I, I'm uh, reminded of efforts like teaching at the right level, like the graduation model, which are also multi-country evidence and, and studies, which have been really critical to inform what can work across settings and at scale. Claire, could you share a little bit what are some specific questions that we're looking at in these replication trials? Sure. So I guess first and foremost, we want to know can and how does this program that was developed in Botswana work across heterogeneous contexts? And so that's why we're testing it in so many different countries and regions. And then we're also hoping to answer some questions around scalability. So, for example, does it make a difference if the government's implementing it versus NGOs? And so we really can't wait to share the results in the next few months. Really exciting. In addition to our direct replication work, there's also been a series of efforts in Sierra Leone by Center for Global Development, some co-authors in Bangladesh, as well as in Kenya, who've been working on similar approaches. So really excited to also see how the entire literature starts to shake out uh, and see what we're learning across these settings. So shifting gears, Claire, a lot of folks tuning in will be very interested in this intersection between evidence and action. And you've been a joint postdoc at Young Lab and CSAE. So we'd love to hear about your experience in this dual role. What has really been exciting for you? Yeah, very happy to share. So I guess I always had a hunch that I would learn a ton of things from working with Young Love's master implementers. We've just all heard from Tato, so I know she has a lot to teach everybody. But I've honestly, I've been so blown away by all the things I've learned. So just a few of them. 
I've learned what goes into really careful, high quality implementation. And again, we've just heard some of the, uh, the details from Tato. So it just gives a small window into it. I've also learned that high frequency monitoring data is possible and has been really invaluable in some of our context for getting a quick sense of what's going on and when something might be going off track so that we've been able to course correct. And another thing that I've learned is that really rapidly generating rigorous evidence is doable, which I would absolutely not have thought that a year ago. And ultimately, personally, I've discovered that the joy that I get from running a regression or coming up with a new research question is about the same kind of joy that I get from working with the Young Love team to convert the research insights into action. So it's, it ticks all the boxes. It's super rigorous, scientific, and it's systematic, but it's also immediately useful and immediately used, which is just so rewarding. It's so wonderful to hear that. And I, I think that we've all really come to appreciate there is some method to the madness, both of the research and of the implementation. So that's really wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been such a rich conversation, and it's been so great to get under the hood. I've got a few big takeaways from this conversation around some of the core ingredients of this work. And it's been great to share this with, with our audience. The potential to use rigorous evidence to inform real-time policy, as well as speak and, and uh, connect to a broader literature. Uh, and really excited to share results from the replication studies to any of those who are interested. And I also want to share that the Botswana study paper is out, and that's joint with Peter Bergman as well, who's the co-chair of j Powell's EdTech Initiative. Uh, the replication study will be a multi-country effort with a huge collective, and, and we're so grateful for all of the partners who've supported this work uh, and, and made this possible. So thank you for tuning into this podcast, and please also stay tuned for more CSAE podcasts. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.